these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this lesson is a little bit outside of my usual... Yeah. Is it? I think it's on the other side. Behind the rope. Behind the rope. White. Well, yeah, that was white. The black and rope. That's what I was trying to say. It's a little bit outside of my normal comfort zone with lessons, because usually my mo is information, and I'm just like downloading information into your brain so that you can then sort through later. Where should we upload it from? Should we be downloading? I don't know. We would be down there. He would be up here. Yeah, sure. Oh my gosh, unnecessary. We're gonna do no, something more of more of a, a dialogue discussion sort of thing. I'm gonna be the moderator, if you will. And I want to kind of get us thinking thing. about culture of what it is and how it works. And that sounds like a boring topic, but this will go places. Trust me. Anti-death culture. Yeah. To begin with, what is culture? Brief definition from Google. The arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. What? Any given culture, according to this definition, things like, like art, music, language, uh, customs, food, <laughs> all of those things that a particular people group puts forward and represents itself toward the world through. That is a, th a people group's culture. That is one culture. Does everybody agree with that kind of as a working definition? Anything you'd want to add to or? I'm just offended that they put music as separate from art, honestly. Uh, no, it's a slash. This is probably talking visual talking arts, performance visual. arts, yeah. auditory arts. I mean, I, I acknowledge this, but it just, I saw that and I was just like, you know what, that's upsetting. That, that's the only thing. Okay. Well, there's no, I mean, some of this isn't intellectual, it's just... Well, also, doesn't culture build on um, past events as well? So history yeah. contributes yeah. to culture. I think there should also be something about the restriction of some sort of population. It's the restriction of the population? Like, what do you well, mean? not. Like, there should be a restriction somewhere involving population, I think. Because different populations have different culture. Well, this is just. Well, a, I think that's this is just that's culture. innate yeah. in the statement yeah. that there are sections yeah. of people that have different ones of these. So that yeah, so different culture. the definition of a culture is whatever people group that shares these give it. So this could be this could be put on a single person, or it could be put on America. Okay. Here's an important distinction I want you to think about: What's the relationship between values and beliefs and culture? Are values and beliefs something that a culture generates, or is the relationship different? I think there's driving matters that push values and beliefs, like a fear of death that drives. <coughs> yes, that drives religion or uh, food or all of these things. Okay. So I think there's a direct relationship between. Values, beliefs, and culture. Would you say that the values and beliefs are another thing that the culture produces, like art, food, custom yeah. language? Mm -hmm. I would say or sort of some things. It's not all values and beliefs. I think it's a it's a result, not necessarily. It, it hasn't been like pushed to be created. It's just it happens. Yeah, because I mean, like that whole fat body push. Like, be yourself, even yeah. if you're fat, is based on someone saying, I like food, I'm going to keep eating food, and so it's I don't someone, recognize your... It's someone's value or belief that is driving the culture. And even though in the past it was value that a slick body was important mm -hmm. or healthy. Okay, there, so I... We're starting to get what, with what, one of my primary points about culture that I think is lost in the dialogue is that values and beliefs are the core of a culture. The things that, re that 
our culture. A culture is a visual communication of values and beliefs. A set of values and beliefs common to a certain people will generate a culture. Yeah. Uh, it's an and expression. It's so fluid. Yeah. It's, there's no hard and fast culture. It's really fluid. It yes. It changes from person to person. Not all of those things are going to be the same for one, for two people. Yeah. Uh, there'd be, there would be broad commonalities between a particular group of people, right? So let's put this in the real world real quick and, and analyze it. Think of like the whole Muslim thing. That when you showed us the video about how they were broad brushing Muslims yeah. about how genital mutilation is uh, done in North Africa, I think it was. Uh -huh. And he was saying, you know, that's that's not what all Muslims believe. They uh -huh. do it there, and there's Christians that do that in Ethiopia or whatever. Right. So yeah, some of these overlap in different different ways. There's not there's not a homogenous culture anywhere that crosses all borders. Is what that what you're saying? Okay. Um, th let's think of, of one this this more recent uh, African culture. Just put on display in the Black Panther movie, Wakanda Forever, right? I wouldn't know. The expressions of the cultural values of Wakanda. Would, what, what would be the cultural values of Wakanda and what would be the expressions of those values? I did not see the movie. Which one of these right now? I haven't seen it, but I think unity is probably pretty important. Okay. Who has seen Black Panther? Hurry. Let's really think of a different example. When I was watching the movie, though? Uh, I was just kind of watching because I was bored. That doesn't. So. Okay. Okay, where'd you watch it? How about the Harry Potter movies? Have you seen those? What? what? No. Huh? What? Harry, Potter Harry Potter movies? Yeah. No. I was not allowed yes. because it has been. I'm here. Okay. What now? I'm paying attention now. Like you weren't paying attention before? Gee. I was, I was not paying attention. Okay, let's, let's think of Hogwarts. Okay. was not paying attention. What are the values in Hogwarts and the beliefs? And what are the expressions of those values that we see? What's the culture created for Hogwarts? So they value and intellect. And intellect. They value intellect. Okay. Separation, yeah. bravery, ambition, ambition, and intelligence. Intelligence <laughs> and uh, what about loyalty? Don't forget loyalty. The there we go. Excuse the four you. houses represent four different values, right? Intelligence. You. He was just commenting on because they're a school. As a whole, separation from people who are different. Yeah, okay, yeah, the, the hard division between wizards and mugg muggles. Mm -hmm. And then the weird dynamic that that creates when you have a wizard born to muggles. Yeah, you deal with all those cultural problems of, of the overlap and the, the clashing of cultures. Teamwork uh, between subcategories of all right. teamwork. Uh, student okay. bodies, yeah. like yeah. different yeah. houses. What would be some of the visual or, or cultural representations of those values. I mean, uh, the houses eat together on long tables. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Yeah. So yeah, the, the unity yeah. Of, of teamwork. Competition would be the, between Quidditch. Quidditch would be, would be an example. between the houses. So Quidditch would be a cultural example of the value of competition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, House points. Which is House also points. competition. Yeah, reward reward of for behavior for behavior and achievements. I mean, they all and what share. is the basis of their of their good behavior? In Whether or not a teacher says so. Whether or not a teacher says so, right? So a Slytherin, uh, what Snape would sometimes reward Malfoy for despicable things that other teachers would have been deducting point, house points for, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're, we're in a we're in a morally moral relativist closed society in Hogwarts. We're in. It's, it's whoever has the most power makes the rules. So they have a different language from muggles. They they know what Quidditch is. They know what all these houses That's yeah. mean. Yeah. So they have they have language. language. They have language that that doesn't it's, cross the borders of that culture. I'll tell you a more specific word. They have. Plus, it's on my files. They, they have rituals. rituals. They have rituals. The, the train ride. You 
going up. Good. The, so yeah, rituals and traditions. The train ride going up. The the uh, the first years going across the lake, and then the rest of them going in the carriages. the carriages drawn by thestrals. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. What about uh, religion and rituals in that sense of, of religion? Is there religion in Hogwarts? Magic. Kind of. Yeah. yeah. They, yes and no. Um, yeah. Because you can be someone who's fighting for the good or like say you're a follower of Voldemort. That's sort of like a religion and you're a cult. Mm -hmm. And a part of me. Yes. Um, so it would have its own subculture <laughs> of Voldemort followers that are inside the wizarding world yeah. and non-Voldemort followers. Okay. Um, also, people who think that wizards shouldn't be hidden from the world. Yeah. People I mean, want to take like the. Everyone's fighting to protect him. Yeah, Harry. Harry is like a like an idol for lots of wizards, right? What are you getting frustrated about? I just hate Harry Potter, like the person. Uh, he's just really whiny, and honestly, I'm just not wrong. Wrong's where it's at. Do you see a lot of his style using yourself, Leah? What? I'm not that whiny anymore. <laughs> That's why. Like you know. <laughs> Don't set up the best case for yourself. <laughs> Not whiny Don't anymore. Anymore. No clear so religion, with the possible exception of the magic being the basis of their religion. There's more the, idolatry than religion. Yeah. Is that any Still, yeah. yeah. Well, I know. Well, but like, each, each one has its. It's, it's more individualistic. It's not as unified, yeah. and it's not as shared. There's the idea of of manipulating things to produce outcomes that you want. That's what magic is, right? Yeah. Getting an edge. It's very much a dog. Dog eat dog kind of world. Morally relative, physically relative. There are limitations on what you can do with magic, but whoever can manipulate it the best wins. And then, yet, in the midst of all of this, you have this idea, this dynamic of good and evil. For some reason, in this world, there exists a good and an evil, and Harry keeps winning in the end because. Can. In the, the grand the story, game. the point is he's representing good and good triumphs. Also, he has plot armor. Also, he has what? Plot armor. Plot yeah, I never armor. really learned, learned armor something. Armor made yeah. from plots. He just sort of does. Meaning everything just works out for him? Yeah. yeah. It has to, because the plot says it must. Yeah. What if it didn't, yeah. though? Harry Potter. Harry Potter in particular mm -hmm. borrows a whole lot of things from a lot of different cultures and a lot of different worldviews and kind of thrusts them all together in a way that works until you start thinking about it too much and it breaks down. <laughs> That'd be an uh, example of it. You're, so we're on track though, right? You guys are understanding what we're talking about. What it's talking place. paintings. They're art. It's of past people. People that lived in the past. Mm -hmm. So, history. I'm not that's sure that's how that works. What is the relationship between race and culture? There's a close relationship between them. Generally, races. There's like two levels of culture in that case. There's like the underlying culture of like, say, African American. You hold to the culture of Africa as your homeland. But you also have your own culture of like rich like traditions and things and all that mm -hmm. before that you've learned and dealt with in the years that you've been in America. So okay. it's like an underlying culture and a more present culture. Okay. So the, this this historical influence of culture yeah. that we're okay. I think I have. We're gonna hold the idea of the historical influence of culture. It's gonna be. Part of the last slide that I have, so. Yeah, but I, mean, I agree. Uh, it's more about the area that you're you're in. I mean, if a black person is in a white culture, then they're probably going to be more prone to follow white culture than white culture. Stephen, they're going to be more prone to follow in the culture that white people follow or the people around them follow than black culture because they're not introduced to it. So the culture that someone adopts is very much geographically based is what you're saying. Mm. Culture. Okay. It's like that one movie you told us about where that 
white guy was adopted, and he thought... The jerk, the jerk right, with Steve, jerk. Steve Martin. Yeah. I, was I was born, born a poor black, black child. child. <laughs> He's white. It's fun. Okay. It's fun. Well, I think culture, what's it called? Culture is generally uh, it's more or less the same within populations, and populations are made generally people of the same race. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I agree. What? So what is the, there's, you you said something earlier, there's a very close relationship between race and culture, mm -hmm. but they're not the same. You can't say black culture and then everyone who is black must must ascribe to these values and appreciate these expression of those values. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a distinction somewhere. So what is the relationship, what is the distinction? I think the relationship is largely geographic and interlinear. Generally speaking, your culture you adapt you adopt those of your parents, and generally speaking, you have the same color skin as your parents, and so it culture gets passed around. And if your parents mostly hang with black people and don't intermingle with other races, then you're gonna want to hang with only black people. Right, or and we're getting back to this idea of history. Or people who um, have grown up in the same culture as you, not specifically one race. It's just just the collection. There you go. Race is very, it's segregating. It's all about the color the of the skin is kind of incidental to the culture. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's a lot about comfort zone. So if you feel like someone is the same as you, then you, you feel more comfortable with them than if you go out into the sticks being a city white person. There you go. And hanging with some, some people. Yeah, I agree. So here's a here's a question again for you to draw a distinction and similarities in your mind. Um, someone who's the same as you, does that mean someone who's the same as you visually or someone who shares the same values that you do? Values. Typically values. Unless you're biased. Values would never mind that doesn't make sense. I think that visual initially. I th I think visual that, initially? I think that initially you feel comfortable with people who are visually similar to you, who are look like outwardly you. appear to be similar, but then the more you get to know someone, that has less of an effect and it's more mm -hmm. uh, inward. Yeah, the, the visual aspect of comfort level, I think, is particularly true. And I would guess, I don't actually have statistics to back this up, but the, the more educated you are, in a Western sense, the less the visual impacts your comfort level with others. As, as education level goes up, uh, comfort level based on visual appearance goes down. No, I wouldn't agree with that. Because so in the example of see if there's a really smart educated guy in a suit mm -hmm. walking up to some bum, the comfort level will, there will no be, no really, there won't be a lot of comfort there. Like a guy walks up on the side of the street, he you'd feel more comfortable with a man walking up to you who's dressed like you than you would a guy raggedy clothes, beard, or okay. whatever, un, unwashed. Good. One of the unwashed masses Good call. walking up to you, you would feel much less comfortable. Even if he is, an, even if he's a genius. Yeah, the good distinction. Genius. So, uh, could we say visual? The the more educated you are, the less. Com the less, the lower your comfort level with with the visual of things that you know are not under someone's control. Yeah. Maybe Sex. The more, the more aware race. you are of people's circumstances. Yeah. yeah. But, so in that case, the person would be uncomfortable because of inferences he makes based on the appearance the, that would be the legitimate. Assumption. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not highly educated, so I don't know. <laughs> I just. Know my comfort zone at this point right now. What about the the and so this is I, I get into lots of these conversations with with people, particularly uh, my black and Mexican friends. I want to talk about this stuff a lot. And the there's often the impetus to start conversations or start statements with, well, I'm white, so, or, well, I'm black, so, well, I'm Mexican, so. Are you serious, or? Yeah, yeah. 
You've never I've experienced never, that? No, no, I've, I've experienced only done that. it ironically. Uh, and like, that actually makes me happy. Uh, that's something that's very common, at least in the millenn millennial generation, which you guys are not in. Uh, well, I'm, I'm you're on the very tail end of it. I mean, yeah, I think it's the very tail end. Yeah, you're, you guys are kind of in the, the cross. You're probably still millennial. Uh, Unfortunately. But identity politics is, is the shorthand for it. The idea that because you look a certain way, belong to a certain group, particularly skin color, uh, you must have a certain set of values. Well, and I, I want to make sure that's a clear distinction in your guys' minds. You don't have to think a certain way because you look a certain way. I think that's stupid beyond belief. I chose so my... I don't like spices. I got through my issues with that. Like, it actually happens a lot. It's really annoying. You're like, no, I like spices. Yeah. yeah, this is that's something I as a as a white person growing up in Asia experienced quite a bit. You would have to really, really ask for the extra hot stuff over and over and over again because the Asians would assume you can't handle the kind of spiciness that we put in our food usually because you're white. Okay. Yeah. It's just where you're where you're raised. It's the geographic area. And the culture that you're raised it's in. It's very much geographically molds based. Your, molds your, your culture. Okay, well, so, okay, this is good. We're going to keep moving. Uh, talking about the culture wars. Politics. Hey, the politics. Well, Texas is in the middle of the obvious survey. What are the drivers of American yeah. culture? What are the things that, that make American culture what it is? People think <laughs> race, yeah. but mainly the geographic area the Alaska. and how and history. Geographic area, history. The, the perception of who is being victimized. The perception of who's being victimized. Okay, so the the power dynamics, the hierarchy that the, the, the perceived hierarchy agreed on generally by the culture. Yeah. Yeah. Are these the yeah. correct drivers? Are these the things that should be driving? What should be driving American culture if they're not? Jesus. Or Jesus. Why? Because it's just supposed to be how everything is. Because truth is supposed to drive everything. Interesting. So you would say truth should be the driver of American culture, and since Christ identified himself as the truth and you believe that, you'd say Jesus should be the driver. History has a lot to do with it too, because I mean, America has such a unique history compared to all the other countries that I mean, we should really stick. In what way? What unique well, things I mean, are you thinking we, of? We, I mean, we broke away and like we've always been, like you know, a free country. Well, freedom from like, sorry, what I'm saying, but uh, like you know, we've always strived to have that independence and the more. This is going to, I'm a little biased, but to be like more focused on the individual as opposed to the whole. Absolutely. Thing. I agree entirely with everything you just said. Yeah. Um, Another interesting thing about America is that we're one of the only countries who almost entirely wiped out the original culture. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there are very, there are quite a few things that makes America, or I should say the United States. Uh, it's very also a unique. collection of a lot of different cultures. It is a cultural it's melting been known as, yeah. yeah. It's been known as a place of refuge right. throughout the histories. So yeah, you have the founding. The, the, the terms of the founding of our, of our nation are very unique. Mm -hmm. um, we fought a war with the greatest superpower on the planet at the time and won. Not expected. We had a founding document that was based around certain principles that gave, gave this nation a particular value system. They said, these are the values that we want our culture to be, be expressing. Again, not something that was done pr prior to America's founding. Other, other countries have later come back and said, these are, the adopt these are the values we want to shape our country to be. They have not said, these are the, the values we want to found our country on. We're arguably the most hypocritical country, probably. Because? Uh, the first conflict we got into, fighting the biggest superpower, was due to oppression of the people, and now we greatly, then we greatly celebrated genocide and oppression. The genocide we committed in taking America. Uh, Manifest destiny. Okay, you're talking uh, 
You're talking about Indian genocide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The the anthropological views of the founding. What is a man? A who who man. is a man? Who owns land? A white landowning man. I think Which also man is. kind of a. I'd push back a little bit. They would also say women were part of humans, uh, but Black held humans. certain lesser status. Put it that way. The victory of the underdog is very much celebrated, I think, even if, yeah. even if it's not necessarily true. Okay. Or the idea of the underdog is very really celebrated. Yeah. Like the whole riots thing about how they're trying to get the underdog to win by pushing it so hard that anyone who refuses is evil because they just want these riots to keep happening. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the like, like example the like the Ferg Martin. Ferguson riots and mm -hmm. oh, okay, gotcha. All right, keep the, this going. What about uh, how do politics interact with this? We started to touch on that. What? How do politics interact with culture? Let's yeah, stick with America as our case subject. It's all about your worldview. Once you start appealing to a specific culture or ideal or ideal that that culture upholds. That culture will start to back you and start to identify with you. Say, oh, this person could lead us. Politics latch onto specific parts of the culture that people agree with to gain power. Like if some people think that one part of the culture is more important, they will follow that side versus the other. Also, nowadays it's high. It's very high identity identity politics. That's identity it. politics. Uh, meaning, uh, your politics is determined by your visual appearance, or the people group that you, or enter the culture that you parts of your support. culture that you identify as part of your yes. your visual. Okay. Identity. This comes back to the idea of the founding of the nation and and America being a melting pot of cultures, meaning it is a huge group of many subcultures. I'd say it's starting to stray away from that. Or like, instead of us all mixing together and creating ideas together, we're starting to separate more and more. So where America used to be a, you come here, you adopt our values and express those values by whatever means you want. So bring your Irish music and your Irish food, as long as you're using them to express the values we have founded our country on. Mm -hmm. The expressions of your culture match our values, so we're good. Uh, it's becoming more of a each subculture brings their values in and tries to keep them in conflict with the founding values of the nation. Yeah. They're mistaking the expression of the values with the values themselves. You with me? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what is uh, politics? It has a lot of different meanings. Um, Somebody, somebody Google the different definitions of the word politics. What are the ways we use the word politics, though? Talking about the government. Your so world. Talking yeah. about the government, not, just oh as yeah. a general, like, a Government. Saying, governmental yeah. interactions. The governmental interaction. I guess more, a lot like, you know, the process of, not necessarily ruling, but, like, you know, of power. Because something that I've, learned, or not necessarily learned, but realized with everything that's been going on at Northwest is there's just so many, like, just politics that happen, like, you know, the, like, like, you know, somebody promised to do this thing, and, like, you know, like, this person is mm -hmm. in power, but, like, they're not paying attention to what other people have to say and everything, and just, like, that's so politics. we So it's we there. use the word politics as a term for... Uh, Unkept promises or inefficient action? I mean, I would say politics is the act of making and or choosing sides in order to gain power. Okay. That's how I would define it. Uh, Alright. So, Literally just uh, relating to the city. The police is city. Greek. And the 
just means it means relating to the city. What what are the the things that we're doing to to bring the city together to create a culture? Politics is very much related to intertwined with culture and how it's made and how it's expressed. What were you gonna say? No, I just had the definitions here. Yeah, what are the definitions that they give? Um, so the first one, the activities associated with the governance of a country or other area, especially the debate or conflict among individuals or parties having or hoping to achieve power. Now there's the so that was kind of Jonathan's definition. So the activities of governments concerning the political relationship between countries. So that's the original definition Leah gave, just relating to the government. Activities within an organization that are aimed at improving someone's status or position and are typically considered to be devious or divisive. This would be the, the whole ineffective for sordid gain sort of thing. The politics used as a negative descriptor. Are there any more? The study of the academic study of government and the state. The activity. A particular set of political beliefs or principles. And then the classic using the word in the definition. So the assumptions. Politics is all about political stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the assumptions or principles relating to or inherent in a sphere, theory, or thing, especially when concerned with power and status in society. Okay. All right. How do how does American politics work? Our, our political system. Uh, what are the three branches of government? Just so we know. Legislative, legislative judicial, and presidential. And executive. 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 Legislative, judicial, and executive. What is the legislature's basic job description? Make and interpret laws. Right? Make and interpret laws. Yeah. What is the executive's job description? Or filter. Foreign policy, interacting with, as the head of a country. Uh, foreign policy, uh, yeah, the, the most basic definition of the executive branch would be to, to do the laws. Congress says, hey, uh, we want $500 to go to every member of the populace. The executive branch's job is to take the money and give it to the people. Exactly, execute act, to execute the law. There are other things that sort of encompass that. Foreign uh, affairs sort of falls into that, but there's a lot of stuff like that, that that goes between both the legislative and executive branch. What's the legislative, or excuse me, the judicial branch's basic job description? Two, four. Is it planning? No. Two, four. Okay. It would be to uh, yeah, follow the law, I guess. See, this is where, where uh, partly history is just changing the definition of... So the court system is under the judicial. Yeah, the court system is the judicial branch, basically. So it's, to, it's to arbitrate disputes on, in, on the law. It's so between the executive branch and the people who are being imposed upon by the law. Right. Or, or if two people with being imposed upon by the law have a dispute, the, the judicial branch is the one who solves the, who makes a ruling on this. To, to rule on disputes is the basic job description of the judicial branch. However, here's the, the fly in the ointment with the judicial branch. You mentioned Congress's job is to create and interpret laws. I'd agree. That was the founding idea of the Congress's job. However, through the course of history, particularly Marbury versus Madison uh, changed this the judicial branch, in order to arbitrate, in order to decide disputes, Not they have reason. to also interpret the laws. So they sort of took it upon themselves, as it is our job to interpret the law along with uh, the, the legislative branch, because we have to interpret it in order to figure out who's right who's wrong under this law. Even and that, though they should technically be going to Congress to... To say, what is the interpretation of this law? Okay, now we're executing our judgment on this dispute. And that power has grown and grown to the point that legislate, or the judicial branch can now interpret the law 
Which would if they if they decided sense. to have some sort of an insurrection, they could interpret the law however they wanted, and thus, in effect, create new laws, which is what they've done in a couple of different key cases throughout the years. It would make more sense if the Supreme Court went to the Congress and said, "What did you mean by this?" Yeah, and then every state's governor. And know, then they say, or if they say, "We don't know," or "We can't agree," yeah. then we say, "Well, we we're not going to arbitrate then." We, we will not hand a ruling down on this decision. Almost as if the founding fathers knew exactly what they were doing. Yeah. Uh, so. Need to change the laws. Screw the Supreme Court. Or just follow the original ones. We're talking about hmm. another key component to American politics I and mean, American government is checks and balances. The idea of one branch not having too much power. Because, again, the, the values, the government being an expression of the values that man is corrupt, and that if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And we want to keep as much power out of the hands of humans as possible, and at the same time have a solid uh, official officiating body that arbitrates and regulates the nation. Some sort of balance between anarchy and uh, totalitarianism. You guys know what I mean by totalitarianism? I think so. Total control of the government versus no government at all. Yeah. So that is the idea of the American founding. Along with, so we're going to start bringing in the history thing. Along with that, in the historical founding of America, these men, they were all men, and most of them were white. There were a few of mixed descent. Uh, these men had these, uh, these values and the vast majority of them were Christian. They came from Puritan families and that was the culture that they were brought up in. Was the, the idea of a Puritan upbringing. Family structure being key to the su success of a society. They were learning Greek and Hebrew early on and studying the Bible from a very young age. And they were brought up with the belief that man is innately, was created good, but innately sinful after that. And his, the desires of his hearts was constantly on evil. These, this was the basic anthropology of the founders. And so they created their government system in response to that. On the flip side, they also believed free will, the idea that every man should be able to do what he pleases as long as it does not interfere with the actions of another freedoms of another. So the Declaration of Independence, you guys you guys know the Declaration of Independence fairly well. What what are what have the colonies resolved that all men are endowed with their creator? The by their creator with unalienable rights. Unalienable what rights to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Everyone deserves to breathe. Everybody deserves freedom. And pursuit of happiness, uh, it's a, a phrase that gets changed here and there in history. It's almost interchangeable with property. John Locke. They were big fans of John Locke. If you read the philosophy of Locke, you pretty much know what America was founded on. Every man has the right to life, liberty, and property. Something that he owns and has domain sovereignty over. So that's what they believed. So they're going to create their government in response to that. I'm seeing eyes close. All of this feeds into the, the culture war. So I, cards on the table, I'm a, I'm a conservative, uh, libertarian-leaning, uh, registered Republican. That was my shocked face. I know, right? Couldn't believe it. How could you see him? You know Basically what, what that means is I, I believe that the Constitution is the founding law of the land, that it should be followed and and obeyed, and anything that is not covered in the Constitution should be left to the states or to the people. Big fan of the Tenth Amendment. It's any of the of the rights and responsibilities not specifically guaranteed to the federal government in the Constitution are reserved to the states and to the people. That's a whole other aspect of this that we won't get into because we're already bored. Uh, but that's that's one side. The other, so I, I believe in conserving the founding values and thus 
the expression of those values in our culture, I want to conserve those because I think they were good values. I think they line up very well with my worldview. The other side, the opposite of conservatism, is usually framed as liberalism, and or progressivism is the the modern day opposite to conservatism. Progressivism says we need to be updating, changing, progressing our values towards their ideal. And that, I think, is one of the inherent flaws in progressivism, is that they do not have an ideal towards which they want to progress. Uh, you ask 10 different progressives what the ideal is, they would say, give you 10 different answers. It's to make sure no one's poor. <laughs> make sure the rich people are poor. Sure yeah. It's, it's mostly it's people who consider man. themselves victims want to get changed their own situation. I agree that that describes a whole lot of progressive liberals. You see me on the street, you see him on the street, you see we're unequal. We need to be equal. These would be the values that they that, that progressivism and give them the fair shake. That's what they that's what they would say that their their values are based off of. They they want equality for all, and they want no one to be in want, and they believe at root that man is basically good and not selfish and will give of himself uh, to his own detriment. Which is not true. Yeah. That and it's seen even in this system. Yeah. That is one of the root differences between progressives and conservatives, liberals and conservatives, is what do you think about man? Do you think he is basically good or basically evil? Conservatives will by and large say man is basically evil. Liberals and progressives will by and large say man is basically good. It's interesting considering the side that says that man is basically good is promoting more government control. Well, that's the thing. It, it, the idea is we need to take take control of people's lives away from man and give it to government. They think of government as an entity not made up of men. Again, a, a, something that I think is a, found, is a foundational flaw in the eyes of most liberals. They, they think it's of government as objective. This is the objective rule. Whereas conservatives, by and large, are usually theists at least, and would say, no, the ultimate rule lies with God, and man is rule of his own domain, life, liberty, property. Anything influenced by man cannot be 100% objective. I would agree. Even the Bible is is uh, subjective to the extent that it was written in a particular time, in a particular language, to a particular culture. I'm sure if you it has to be interpreted thusly. I'm sure if you went up to most progressives today and you asked them if your wife was dying of cancer, but if you if you if you took in bribes from states to and it would help pay for your your wife's cancer treatment. Would you do it? And I would say yes. Hmm. There you go. I don't know, but <laughs> I know where you're going with it. Yeah, it was. It wasn't well Plain. thought out. Last question for this slide: Are there some cultures? Are some cultures better than others? And if so, why? Yes. yes. Some cultures have inherently stronger, correct values and beliefs that they follow. Like okay. education. And some yeah, cultures education. are evil. Some cultures need people. And that's not good. And obviously that's not right. Why is that obviously not right? Because, you know, I mean, just, so just people live. <laughs> also <laughs> people live. And just nobody ever won. Why'd you even ask that question? <laughs> Obviously, it's not right. I would say it all comes down to morality. So any culture with a set of values that aligns more closely with morality as it was set by God is a better culture than those that stray farther away from it. I would say cultures with a religious base are generally more moral than... I don't know. There's culture in Houston right now that that have a religious base that are pretty, pretty bad. People have done terrible things in the name of religion. That's true. They, I guess, it's more similar to God as a religious base. 
Yeah. That'd be the, the distinction I the, I agree with, with Jared yeah. was yeah. the the morality that the more the culture whose values line up more closely with morality as it actually is, as in the character of God, will be a better culture than a culture that is less aligned with those values. So cultures that are more aligned with reality than others. Yeah. Yeah. The more the more God culture, culture whose values. So remember, I I'm, I want to keep this. I I think it's a good language distinction. The center of a culture is values, and everything that we see, the the culture itself, are expressions of those values. So a culture whose values are better, objectively, is a better culture. The expressions of those values can be adapted if the values change to be better. Which brings me to the last slide. Um, Christianity and culture. What is the relationship between the church, universal, and culture? So this is where the, the history thing comes in. The church, universal, spans geography and time. At least 2,000 years old, depending on your view of the church, when did it start? Let's just go with Acts, the book of Acts, somewhere in there, 2,000 years old. What is the relationship between the church, universal, and culture? It's divided, so it's, I mean, it's it's everywhere. It's all over the charts. It's deeply ingrained in culture because it makes up, up our, our values. It tells us what our values are. The creation of the church was also the creation of a new culture. Okay. Explain what you mean more. Because uh, the church was a set of new values that people were following. And because those values were not similar to any of the other people's values, it started its own culture. Okay. So there was an outward expression of that. What kind of new values, values are you talking about? Well, let's, let's go with the assumption that the church begins in Acts. Let's let's say that the, the, the let's assume the church begins in Acts. What are the new values that the church presented to the world that it had not yet experienced? Well, everything that Jesus said. The the role of laws in daily life. The role of laws in daily life. Yes, because you either had a group that said the laws they had lived throughout daily life were everything, and then you had a group that said they were nothing. There is you can live wherever you want. Okay. So, Christianity is, you, know, you follow the laws by God, but it's not everything, because your faith in God is everything. Okay. Uh, I think I, I get where you're coming from. I think I would slightly disagree, though. Because I would say those values are present in the Old Testament. They were just perverted throughout the course of history. That when the laws were given, the point was the laws aren't everything. They are. You're still saved by grace through faith. They were expression. They were. Yes. I agree with that. But expression of the how the church was created. It was a correction was... of what had already gone off. No, so it was a reintroduction sure. of previously given values. Yeah, that's a better way of saying it. But, so then it wouldn't be yeah, a new course. Well, it was not new as in that sort of thing that had been seen before, but new in that time period. Okay. It was instead of re-giving the law, it was hammering in on what you didn't notice about the law. It was that the real law comes into play when you have faith and you live by the law through faith. Yeah. So yes, church... It, it literally put a face and a name on the law. The face and the name was Jesus of Nazareth. Right. But this is something I want you to get. The church, the only thing new that the church gives that, that wasn't already expected, shouldn't have already been expected, 
is the face and the name, Jesus of Nazareth. The church, the, and here I'm, I'm going to say, okay, let's look at the word church in a broader sense of everyone who has believed, who has believed in God and been counted righteous by faith. This would go all the way back to Adam. If we're saying that's the church, is in everyone who's going to make it to the New Jerusalem, that is the true church culture. Is the, the set of values that that body of people believes, which goes all the way back to day six, or at least day eight after the fall. And that is the culture that we are trying to align ourselves with. That is the culture that we are part of. But the breakdown here is this, this culture spans time, whereas other cultures are viewed in a moment in time with their history. Collecting until it, All right. it singles out into a peak. This culture looks back. And says that's the truth has been given all the way since then, and it looks forward to saying, waiting for the resurrection. But its values have remained unchanged. Uh, but the values of the, the people that believe it have changed. So, like, people are taking the Bible not literally, making it an allegorical story, but still believing that Christ came and died for them for their sins. Mm -hmm. People are straying from the culture. The culture of the church. Yeah. Okay. okay so the culture of the full truth, they've narrowed it down and just singled out one point. That is the important point, but they've left out all the rest. Okay. And therefore... Like, so you're saying there'd be subcultures within the church that are straying off the line? Yes. Okay. They're still part of the, the culture. For thinking like... like but not a, like the a whole tube culture. that incorp incorporates everyone who's within the culture and the single line that is the true church culture and you're trying to get close to that. There are people who are getting farther away from the center of the tube, but they're still inside the tube. As the tube is history. Okay. What about the local church? But it's like which is bound by geography there's a center and time. tube and then there's an outside tube. There's there's Jesus in the center and then everyone working outwards. Because no one can hit Jesus. So, Jesus' culture is different from ours. Because he was perfect and he could follow all, all of them. And here's another kink to throw into your, your language. Jesus' yeah. culture is different yeah, to ours. I no, I agree. Um, I, I like it. Put another wrinkle in your brain. The, the, the Jesus' culture... Jesus' culture is different to ours because Jesus is a man who walked around on the earth in Capernaum and around Galilee and Jerusalem in the first century. God's culture is different than Jesus' culture. And that's slightly blasphemous, I know. <laughs> but do you see the distinction I'm drawing? Yes. I think okay. only because he had to relate with the people he was around. Okay. So his, his human form is, is so was Jesus is still one. On. There was the same core as God, but then it had the added historical culture of time. Yeah, the, the tie into this, this stream of culture that spans time had this pinprick moment where God and human culture met. How should the local church interact with and regard culture? It should form the culture around it. Tell people what they're doing wrong in the culture and it should, try and should align be people to our team. Inclusive. Uh, explain. It should not look like any of the other different cultures around it because it is different, but it should not exclude people simply because they are not in that culture. I mean, if you go back to the... And the, if we're talking about culture, uh, define, real clearly define culture. The culture of the Union Roman Church based on the values that were given on... So it should not exclude people who do not share the values of the Universal Church? It should not. There, there should be no walls in joining the culture. 
Like you shouldn't keep people out of the culture. What about the walls of having different values? Well, you would have. Okay. With the directly com. There's more barriers to what God's your values, values are. are. So nothing okay. on top of. Nothing beyond accept our values and you're part of our culture. Yes. Okay. I think the number one interaction should be inviting people to abandon a culture that's based on misplaced values due to a lack of morality and invite them into our own. One more time. Say that <coughs> again. Abandon their current culture that is based on misplaced values due to a lack of immorality. A lack and of morality? Lack of, yeah, lack of morality, my bad. And invite them into our own. Okay. So, like, so it's an invitation to exchange your values for the right ones. Yes. From my perspective. And I would agree, it's the right ones. Okay. So there's a lot of unnecessary things in that culture grab for following the faith. You're talking about this? Yeah. So like... So beliefs. for Christianity, so this is where I think this is a uh, this is good graph is inaccurate. I would say this and this mm -hmm. are the same thing, and they are the center. And culture is a word that is a plot made up of all these things that go around it. Yes. Last question. This is where I wanted to get to, and then we'll call this a discussion while I have. To what extent does the original culture of Christianity determine our practice of it today? Yes. The original expressions of the values. I'd say it's changed. Are the same. It's changed a lot from the original way. So yeah, give me give me some for instances. What what things have for changed? Instance. What are expressions of values in the first century Christian culture that have changed for um, the us today? way that the church gave? that it had pretty much in the way that like the giving like in Acts when it says that they just gave things to the poor and people who needed them that, uh -huh. is, that does not happen now okay how would I mean, you say rightly or wrongly you I say, would say you say uh, that is a value now that... it's not necessarily as needed as people aren't begging on well well it's not as much of a need now but people could give more the okay. church has become wrong. more institutionalized yeah Less of a, a, a brotherhood of thought and more of a, a place. More of an emphasis on the local yeah. than on the universal. And it's not even a focus on the local. It's a focus on the people inside the church. and not in, It's not the same. It's Their culture before was a meeting place to affirm belief and then spread out and go and preach to all the world. Ours is and now just... Change other people's values to align with their own. Ours now is just like... It's just become stagnant. Okay. Our money is staying it, within the church. It's almost become like an yeah. escape where people get away from the world. That kind of the church. Yeah. Okay. And we're talking about the local church now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. There's not much well, of even, an emphasis on the worldwide church anymore. Even the universal church, it, it's all across the world. It, I'm not saying every church is like this, because there's a lot of evangelistic churches that go out and are the hands and the feet. But okay. All right, this, uh, this is kind of sidetracked into a side discussion, which I think is a good one, but not one I want to have right now. And the side discussion that we're having is problems we notice in the local church of how its value or how its its values are not aligning with the, with the true values of the church which i agree with by and large there are many local churches whose values are not aligning with the true values of the universal church but good discussion good exercise to have but not the one i want to have right now which is to what extent does the original culture of christianity determine our practice today yeah you were closer to it me uh but I'm going to push back on what you were saying. Of, of in Acts, you have the people who are, are sharing everything that they have. And those, the original culture was one where um, everyone, the expression of the culture was we'd get together and we'd have food every day after, every, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. But I would push back on your understanding of the book of Acts. Which is, Acts is a transitionary book. That culture that you just described only goes on for four chapters. Yeah. 
and then it falls apart. Human sinfulness enters the picture again. I think you got to get to the end of so the Jude. So, what is the original culture of Christianity? I mean, that's a good question. Okay, so let's. Spreading the hands of. See, I'm thinking it's the original culture is the first four chapters of Acts. Okay, four chapters. The original. So yeah, defining terms and original culture. What do I mean by that? The original culture of the church of Christianity being. Let me sort this out of my head before I say it aloud. I was thinking when I wrote this, the original culture being the, the first century expressions that adopted the new values of the church, right? particularly first century Jewish expressions that adopted the new values of the church or readopted the old values of the church. Right? Things like communion. How did the first century Jewish Christians practice communion? Well, they did it at their Passover feast when they're remembering the Exodus. They have the lamb, they have the bread, they have the wine, they break the bread. That expression of culture, the food, the, that ritual, uh, has it changed for the church today? Well, we don't do the Passover because we're grafted in and we're not. So we're not remembering the Passover, or we don't do the Passover because we're necessary. grafted because we're Gentiles. Yeah, okay. We were, uh, we were not a part of the Exodus. Do we do we sit down for a meal uh, when we, we when we do communion? We don't. So the ritual has changed. Do we use uh, fermented grape juice or unfermented grape juice? We step on some Baptist toes here. <laughs> Most of us. Go to churches where we use unfermented grape juice. But that's mostly legal stuff, though. Right? More, no, no, you're allowed to use it in church. It's more mostly legalistic <laughs> uh, stuff. I thought it was because everybody legally couldn't participate. No, no I mean, in churches in Texas, you can drink as long as your parents are in the room. Yep. So, yeah. and, and actually, in the entire United it's States, if it's for, if it's for well-recognized religious practice. So Catholics everywhere are allowed to, if, even if they're under 21, are allowed to drink. They use alcoholic wine in, in their Eucharist. And then it's not like they, they give the kids a big Yeah, it's not like they take this picture. But uh, to what extent does that expression of, cult, of the culture, of the values, change? It's so the, the core values <laughs> from the original Christianity are the same. <laughs> But they have manifested themselves. Different. So, what is the value that is being expressed in communion? The remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. The remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. The gospel. Through the act of eating and drinking. Eating and drinking. Following Would you the say that practices that Jesus did on the night and said, it. "Do this in remembrance of me." Yeah. Right. Okay. But when Jesus was talking, he was talking about a particular ritual. Whenever you eat of it, meaning the Passover meal. Do this in remembrance of me. So two questions. First of all, do Gentiles have to take communion? Yes. Mm, I would think have yes, to? because now we're, we could we be here. Interesting. We don't have Second to. question, was just to, to pick your brain about the original culture. Are we supposed to do communion or are we supposed to do Passover? Okay, good question. Is there a difference? Yeah. In, yes. Is the yes. original culture that it was established, is that... How much of what? What was that? Uh, what portion of that was values, and what portion of that was expressions of the values? We would agree that the expressions of the values can change, but the values should not. If we said that the values are remembering Jesus Christ, so are we going to add in eating and drinking as part of the values, or not? Or is that an expression of the that's values? an expression of the values? So could we take communion by sitting around and remembering and not doing any physical act? Yes. yes. No, I don't think because. It's it's like, I'm just turning the pot right now. Oh, it's, 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 I don't like this pot, sir. It's confusing. Because there's not a whole lot of other things to go off. What, what was the context in which Jesus said? Was he, he, he was either talking to the disciples. He's talking to the apostles. Less Judas. Yeah. And less Paul. So if, if it was purely in that just that time, saying, when you guys do this, you know, remember me, or was he... So, so do even any of the rest of Christians have to, or is it just the apostles? 
I think it's a good practice. So here's another. So Paul repeats the instruction on communion I in First Corinthians, uh, or is it Second Second Corinthians? I think uh, talking about when you no, it's First Corinthians. First Corinthians eleven. When you, when you when you take communion together and you the, you do not wait for the rest of the for your entire assembly to be present, and uh, you can go read it in First Corinthians. And some of you take communion and have something against your brother in your heart. It's better for you to to first forgive your brother and then and then partake of the meal. But again, he refers to it as a meal. What do you do with that? We don't treat communion as a meal anymore. I think it's the same as Passover. In that it's it's remembering the day that God did something awesome and all of Jews did it. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically the same thing for Christians. Communion is the Passover for the Gentiles. I think that when okay. he said, do this in remembrance of me, the remembrance of him is the value. And he was instructing them on how he wanted them to go he about would. showing that value. Uh, okay, so the eating would be, eating and drinking then would be part of the instruction and do this. Yes. And that's how they're going about showing the value. Yes. And so eating and drinking is, is inherent in the idea of communion. You'd say. It depends on how, how you define it. I don't yeah, think it, it is. is. It, 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 it depends if you define it as the ritual or as the value. Okay. So which one did Jesus, did Jesus define it as? Because the idea would be we won't be on, on board with whatever he would say, right? Yeah. I think that he clearly stated to the apostles the, the, the ritual. But I, I don't know through context. I would have to go and look at the text to be able to make a decision on if that does apply to us. Okay. I think it's easier for me now to remember Jesus' sacrifice, eating and drinking, than not having the physical representation and just... So you're saying, you're saying that technically speaking the eating and the drinking isn't required for communion to be had, but it's a pretty darn good uh, expression of the value of communion, and so and, we're going to keep it. I mean, especially since we, we may not know if he was just talking to the apostles or if he was talking to everyone. Okay. I think it's a good... What if we, what if we had communion with uh, Coke and chips? I think that would be fine. It's a modern day. It, yeah. I don't know. What if, what if all of the bread and wine suddenly stopped existing? So there's an interesting question. Does the scarcity of the bread and the wine make the acceptance of Coke and chips okay? Or is it, if you have the two options, doesn't matter which one you choose, they're equal in value? I don't think. I think bread and wine. Speaking from a ritual a option. standpoint of the ritual, it doesn't really matter. But in the terms of like the meal and stuff, it would. Uh, or whatever. What were the two ritual and what what? The value. Value, the value. And ritual. Yeah. Then yeah, in terms of value, it would. But ritual. It would. Okay. I think I think going coke and chips modernizes it a little bit too much, and sort of rips rips it off a little bit too much, saying you can take things a little bit less seriously. I think it depends um, on how you interpret it. I think if you, if the more literally you take what he said, the less okay it becomes to deviate from that exact There also moment. needs to be an understanding among the people partaking in communion that it is a, a moment of remembrance. To not make it, as Nathan says, something that's modernized and less in, serious. Less serious, yeah. There needs to be but the it does not, that does not effectually communicate yeah. the values. Yeah. You need to be able to have the understanding to recognize that it is important. And then once the rec once the understanding is there, it, I don't think it necessarily matters what you use as long as you remember. I think if I ever had the choice, I would definitely go bread and wine. 100%. Uh, I wanted to mention something uh, based on word choice in 1 Corinthians 11. Yeah. Um, Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 11. Yeah, uh, starting in uh, 24. Um, 
says, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, uh, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And in that time, wine was had with many meals. Um, I think one of the points he's getting across is not about the choice of food, but the frequency with which they had wine and bread. Um, so you're to saying often, to often remember the fulfillment of God's promises to us or to His His people. So, so you, you think we've over ritualized communion? I think we've over ritualized. That. That's the, what it sounds. Like. I think we've over ritualized the food, the choice of drink and the choice of food. Uh, but rather, the point was to remember the, f the fulfillment of God's promises to us. And it's like something culturally we do often. Like if we ate a sandwich, we broke the sandwich, and we had a soda. Remember that Christ, Christ died on the cross because. I'm not saying that's, yeah, see, that's the only saying. point, but I'm, I'm, saying. I'm saying I think one of the big points is don't forget. But so you would be saying I think if I'm, tell me if you would answer this question this, the way I'm saying you would answer. Okay. If that Paul was not necessary, Jesus when he instituted communion, and Paul when he's talking about it. They were not speaking of the Passover meal when they said this, whenever you, whenever you eat of it, drink of it. They weren't talking about the Passover cup and the Passover bread, unleavened bread. They were just talking about eating and drinking, period. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I, I would agree with that. Okay. Though, can we even compare this to ourselves? Because Jesus was speaking to all Jews in this situation. Yes, and he was. your Gentiles who do not partake in the Passover feast. Yeah, so, so our status as Gentiles who are grafted into Israel is something that is quite underdeveloped in our church practice and doctrine. That's why I don't think the two are connected, is because uh, Passover feast was not for us as Gentiles, but uh, Jesus' death on the cross does. Uh, is applicable to Indeed. Gentiles. And who's Paul writing to in First Corinthians? Probably Jews. Gentiles. Gentiles. Oh. Okay. Corinth is a Greek city. Yeah. Probably very low Greek, Jew population, and there's a whole lot of stuff on there in First Corinthians about how you Jews and Gentiles get along. So again, reading the Bible in the first century lens is important. You have to remember half of the New Testament books are telling Jews and Gentiles how to get along in this new body. A component of this whole discussion with the uh, let's actually let's read First Corinthians 11 after the head coverings part. We don't need to get into that. Uh, <laughs> Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. He says this again in First Corinthians 15. He says, that which I delivered to you, which is the gospel. That the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. Also, after supper, say, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whatever... Whoever eats the bread or drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the blood, body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats the drinks, eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. Notice the difference between uh, the, the use of the word body there. Judge the body rightly. What's he talking about? What body? Your own body. Three options: your own body, the body of Jesus, represented by the bread, the church, church. or the church. Which one is he talking about? For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep, aka are dead. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. When we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. 
Ramming matters how well range when I come. They got all kinds of problems with the way that they're doing the Lord's Supper. And he specifically says, uh, eat before you come. So this should play into your discussion of determining, are we talking about just any time you eat, just the Passover meal, or are we talking about some new ritual that is given that should be passed down? And so it's not it's supposed to be a part of a meal. And it's, so it's not the Passover meal, otherwise you would, they wouldn't. The whole eating thing. Don't eat before you come. Yeah. Although you could technically have a meal with your brothers before and then go and take communion. communion. So this is one example. Uh, another one is baptism. How do we how do we practice baptism? Uh, how did they do it back then? How much of the form of practicing baptism is intricate or integral to the function of baptism. What is the yeah? What is what is the relationship between form and function and the ordinances and practices of the church and how do they relate to culture? How much of them are culturally bound? How much of them are eternal forms? And so this is what something I want. I I'm, I've come to my own conclusions on some of these things and some of them I'm still batting around. But it's something I would encourage you to think about as as you're going about your Christian life and practicing Christianity. Think about the forms that you're using, the rituals, the expressions of culture, and think about the values behind them. And then ask yourself, how much of these forms that are presented in the Bible are necessary to bring into the present, and how much are not? And come up with some sort of a clear distinction of how you determine. Not just based on, well, I like this one, I don't like this one. This one's easy to keep nowadays. This one's not easy to keep nowadays. What's your consistent rule? And it gets tricky. Um, last little quick example. <coughs> I want to talk about with you guys quite a bit. Women teaching in church. This is one that very much today gets pinned on. This is a first century cultural expression of a value that is no longer needed. It was a bad value. It wasn't a true Christian value. It was just an expression of that value. And so we have better values now. Therefore, we don't need to practice it in our culture. In any argument you make, you have the value and the expression that you're arguing for. The expression you're arguing for is women are not to teach men or teach or exercise authority over a man to remain quiet. The value, the reason, for it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. It was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But she will be saved by the childbirth. I hate the way they translate the sentence. If they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Real quick, clarify the fifth, verse 15. She will be saved. She still refers to Eve. She will be saved through the childbirth. Which childbirth? Jesus. Jesus. As in Eve, when she was promised in Genesis 3.15, from you, from the seed of the woman, will come one who will crush the head of the serpent. That is the means by which she, Eve, will be saved in the end times. Uh, if they continue in faith, love, and sanctity, who's the they? The they is correctly pluralized. The women there is not correctly pluralized. So the first half of the sentence is referring to Eve. The second half of the sentence, if they... Continuing faith, love, sanctity, with self-restraint. Who's the they? A couple of options. Either women, that's the nearest plural uh, antecedent. Uh, women. Problem, uh, is actually, or actually it's not the, the most common reason, plural. It's singular all throughout here. A woman, a woman. For women. Where? There. Uh, above godliness. Rather means a good word is proper for women. Okay, yes. Good. So women is one option. I actually think it's uh, the church. If they have the church, continue in faith, love and sanctity with self-restraint. Or, really, I think it's Israel. Uh, the church is part of Israel. Continue self-restraint. Uh, and then if they make it to the, to the resurrection, then Eve's uh, salvation will be realized. 
And that is literally just the word saved. So, so she will be saved. But this part. This is a, a value. Adam was created first and then Eve. That is distinct from culture. And the expression of that value is women are not to teach men or exercise authority. So to what extent do the values in the culture line up? To what extent is the first century culture influencing this, if any? And to what extent should that change based on our culture? Is this a cultural instruction or not? I would say it's not. And I would say lots of the things, so <coughs> tip my hand on where I land on communion, I actually do think we're supposed to be using specifically unleavened bread and alcoholic wine, because that's what Jesus used. Uh, and I would say, in the case that uh, scarcity presents itself, if you don't have unleavened bread or wine, then the point is, uh, is for the remembrance, preserve the, the value if you have no ability to preserve the ritual, but the ritual is still important and should be preserved by, by any means necessary. That'd so be where I land on all that. So when do you think men and children become men? I think in 13. 13? The reason I, I think that is because Paul is writing this in a Jewish context. And so I want to ask myself, what does Paul mean by the word man? And in Paul's Jewish context, a boy becomes a man at 13 when he's born in So, I'm trying to find authorial intent. Paul says, a woman is not to teach or exercise authority over a man, particularly on air, as a grown man. That would be a, a word applied to a, to a boy when he turns 13 in a department school. So, like, if a mother should stop exercising authority after 13, and the father should Also, another good exercise. question. I would, so, I recently wrote a blog post on this, which is part of why it's on my mind. Uh, I would add, uh, in a church setting, women's not to teach or exercise authority over a man in a church setting. And the reason for that is the context of what Paul's talking about. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves. Well, likewise as what? Well, likewise as the men. There's one God, one meteor between man and Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom, a testimony for many in the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher. Therefore I want men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So it bugs me because I can't get around that one, and so I've decided that I need to start raising my hands when we're singing. I don't like it. But I do it. <laughs> uh, but in every place to pray, he's talking about the, the context of the of the weekly gathering of the ecclesia of the church. So, in the church setting, women are not to teach or exercise so authority over men. Ushers should be those people praying and lifting and holding, or the the elders. Uh, uh, just just men. the men. I think all the men should be praying and lifting and holding hands. So you're saying I don't have to put my hands in the air? No, that's it. I think you're free to do whichever, whatever you like with your hands. I'm not. But you can't wear hats. Actually, no, you should wear hats. No, we can't wear hats. We can't wear hats. Yeah. We can't wear hats. Yeah. Can't wear hats. Yeah. You should wear hats. Okay. Preface that with, right that's what I would say. That one I'm not as, as... This one I'm comfortable firmly taking a stand because I've pretty much completely understand what Paul was saying and the point he was making and the support he was giving. And the other I one... I know about that. I've been doing it wrong. And the other one, uh, and the whole head coverings thing... Yeah, I'm curious where you get that, because I always feel really conflicted when we pray, because I'm just like, wait a second. Steven said this, I know he's not an errant, but he's got to have some reason <laughs> to say it, but then I'm just like, wait a second. But yeah, I can walk you through. People don't know this, and so they might see me as disrespectful, because I don't take my hat off, and so I'm just... Real don't say that yeah. because and it is disrespectful with you. when women take off their hats when they pray. What? <laughs> I have no idea so what that be our, She's uh, saying other people uh, think it's disrespectful that she doesn't take off her hat when they pray. Yeah. Because oh, generally everybody yeah. says yeah. she should take off her hat. I was just saying I, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind. Okay. You didn't. I didn't make that sure that's 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 our, that's our personal yeah, and that's, thing. I would. That's something that I hear you on. There's a lot of things. It's like people are going to take the wrong way and you have to be sure of what you believe. Yeah. Doing what doing. That's why I'm curious for you. Yeah, I'll show you. Uh, it's 1 Corinthians 11, if you want to read along. Uh, <clears throat> Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, because you remember in everything, hold firmly to the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. First of all, what are the traditions? 
I think it's the new institutions of communion, baptism, the, the traditions of the, the church, and the gospel. Uh, as in both the new things, quote unquote, that the church is doing, and the old things that the church throughout history is always supposed to be doing. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. <coughs> every man who has on his head while praying something is not actually in the original text. Or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. For she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. What does it mean, the woman whose head is shaved? It's a reference to Jewish ritual that we don't have a whole lot of clarity on. But first century Jewish ritual. That a woman whose head is uncovered while praying or prophesying is the same as the one whose woman is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is graceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head is shaved, let her cover her head. For if a man ought not to have his head covered, for a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. That's the sentence that I just can't get around, or that I don't quite get. So, he's not talking about first century culture. He's clearly talking about creation, man and woman. Woman was created from man. So we're talking about first century culture, but I don't understand the point that he's making with this reference to first century culture, or to the, the original creation culture. And I really don't understand the phrase because of the angels. A woman ought to have a symbol of authority of her, on her head because of the angels. No clue. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man through the woman. And all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her? For her hair is given to her for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. So is hair on the head covered? So there's a whole lot of different interpretations of how people deal with this verse. One is to say that women should have long hair, and that is their covering given to them by God. So in our culture, uh, women should just have long hair, and that is their head covering. They shouldn't have shaved heads. There's an uh, interpretation that says in our culture, the, the, the importance is the symbol of authority of a married woman uh, who is respecting the authority of her husband. And so in, in our culture, a ring does that. Your ring is, is your sign, your symbol of authority. So a woman is to wear a ring when she's pregnant. If she's married. <laughs> so they, there's different phrases throughout this whole argument that people will pull out and say, that's the heart of the argument, so that's the thing that we don't honor. The whole thing is important. And that's, I don't get the argument. I understand the instruction that's being given, and I can't blame it on culture because he's talking about created order, and he says something about because of the angels as being part of the reason for this whole thing. <coughs> but I don't get it. So... I'm not comfortable instructing women to cover their heads while praying, because I don't understand the argument entirely. But I do understand pretty clearly that there's an instruction being given, and I myself am going to defer to it as far as it applies to me. So I'm not going to wear a hat while I'm in church, because it says men should not have a head covering. And I'm going to lift my hands, because in 1 Timothy 2, he said, in the same place that he said women are not to teach men, he said, men, lift your holy hands while praying. While praying. I want men everywhere to be lifting hands, praise the Lord. These are things that I, yeah, these are the conclusions I've come to. I fully admit that I might be wrong and stupid and that they were just cultural instructions. Uh, I just err on the side of caution. It's not too difficult for me to raise my hands in church. And it's not too difficult for me not to wear a hat in church. So I'm just not going to do it. If I were a woman, I'd say it's not too difficult to make sure I have a hat when I'm going to church. Since I don't get it, but I know that he's instructing it, I'm going to wear a hat. Uh, that would be that'd be how I go about this. It's like 
if, 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 my, if my willingness to follow God extends up to, and inclu- up to but not including wearing a hat in church, that's where I draw the line. It's too, it's too much to ask of me, God. Can't handle a hat. Um, I, I think that's a silly line to draw. So I go for it. And that's not to say, I, that, that'd be my own personal, that's, that's where I'm going with this. That's, that's how I interpret He's these. He's directing this exactly at you, Leah. I'm the only girl here, so. I'm directing all the, all the guys, too. That, and that's the other thing that this often gets, gets focused in on women. All, both of these passages have instructions to men that men don't follow either. I see men wearing hats in church, and I think that they shouldn't be. And I see women not wearing hats in church, and I think they should be. I see men not lifting up their holy hands, their hands while praying, and I think they should be. I see women teaching men in church, and I think they shouldn't be. There's both and. It gets focused in on women because it's the more countercultural uh, instruction. I hope you enjoyed this discussion on culture.